All right, let's welcome in our guest, Kevin. Kevin, uh, thanks for joining us. Just so you know, during the Hawks playoff run, we had several, if not dozens of requests for you to come on the show. So for our listeners and our viewers, uh, this is this is a big deal. So thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thank you, guys. This is uh, listening to your podcast a couple times, so this is a joy to be on. We, we appreciate it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the playoffs. So... I, I want to sort of dive into what the Hawks did and and your run with the Hawks, but we're recording this on Monday. Uh, the Bucks are currently up three two going into uh, Game Six tomorrow night at home. Uh, this will come out Wednesday. We we may record something Wednesday morning, but um, you witnessed it firsthand uh, how difficult it is to eliminate this team. I mean, you go back to the Brooklyn series, they seem like they were dead in the water. You guys get up on them. Um, you know, they were down 2-0 against Phoenix. What it is about, what is it about Milwaukee that's so tough to, to beat them four times? Yeah, they just – they're a really deep team. And I feel like they got a lot of guys that right now, like, sacrificing – just guys who – their roles right now on this Bucks team probably aren't what they would be if they're on a different team. And – um Someone I think of firsthand is like Brooke Lopez. You know, Giannis goes out and Brooke Lopez gives us 30. And the next game, it's, you know, he was like a big part of our series. And and Bobby Portis, it, it seems like every time he gets big minutes, he produces big time. And, and then you have their big three of, of Giannis, Drew, and Chris that are so tough. But I just really kind of feel like their team as a whole, you know, they got a lot of really good guys. And even when guys get out, you know, guys that they can plug and play and step in and, and play big minutes for them. And, um, I mean, Giannis by himself, you know this. Every time you play Giannis, it's everyone all build a wall, build a wall. So it's when you're focusing three guys on one person, um, obviously it's a lot easier for other guys to go off. So they're really just kind of a complete team. Um, defensively, they you know, they started out in their, their deep drop with, with Brooke kind of in the paint. And then with us, they started switching everything. And now in this Phoenix series, they went back to the drop. So I feel like they can, they can switch it out. They can do a lot of different things. And um, a team that's kind of been through it. So – they were tough for us. You know, we got two wins out of them, um, two wins against them, but they're a really tough team, obviously. Obviously, you guys both know this, um, but I feel like some of the some casual fans may not have known Chris Middleton before this run. Um, but can you talk about, like, even just Chris Middleton in the last two minutes of games, and he did this against you guys. He obviously did it against the Nets, and he's done it a few times in this in this final so far. Where this guy, he does have, he seems he seems to have like another gear that when it gets to that point, it's like you really want the guy, that guy with the ball in his hands. Yeah, he just gets hot. You know, he gets to kind of points in games where he just feels like he gets unconscious. Where he's a he's a tall guy, he kind of he, he fades away a little bit on every shot, and when he gets going, he he's tough to stop. Just I think it was I think it was game three in our game in our series. Sorry, we were playing at home. Um, it was a one, one series and, and he had, I think 20 in the fourth quarter or something like that, where it just felt like everything he was, he was shooting was going in. And, um, for them again, kind of in this national stage, I think at this point on their team, and, and it wasn't like this the last couple of years, it feels like he's their closer. He's kind of their guy that they give to, to go get a bucket right now at the end of games. And, um, he did that all, you know, against us in our series. And obviously he's done that against Phoenix, but he's a guy that can get really hot and could kind of get to any shot he wants at any time. He's got – Bud has has empowered him. He's given him great freedom to just sort of take any shot. And a lot of their offensive creation runs through him. It runs through that two-man game with Giannis. But to your point, he's absolutely their closer. And some of this is the knock on Giannis, right? I was having this conversation the other day with a gentleman who asked me, if you're starting a team right now for the future in the NBA, are you picking Giannis? He was dead set, like, you got to pick Giannis. You got to pick Giannis. And I – my question to him was, is Giannis a closer? Um, Giannis is going to give – Giannis will have 40-18-9 and nine tomorrow probably. Uh, but when it comes down to we need a bucket, the Bucks run everything through Chris. Um, you brought up the drop coverage because we've uh, talked drop coverage ad nauseum about this on the podcast. But one of the knocks on Bud has been – that he hasn't been able to make adjustments at times in playoff series, and kudos to him. I think they've done it throughout, you know, specifically starting the Brooklyn series where they started really matchup hunting, which is not something he's traditionally done on offense. They started doing that. They've mixed up their defensive coverages. But I want to go back to something you said about Brook Lopez, um, where in your series he had an opportunity to step up and have a big game. Uh, the other night he didn't take – I think he took six shots or something like that. Um your first playoff series, 
our playoff run, you, I think you've kind of figured this out, like series to series, unless you're Trey, unless you're Luca, series to series, your role can shift depending on the team that, that you're playing against and depending on the matchups. Yeah, no, it, it 100% can. And, and Brooke, I think, is, is the number one guy for that. And I think just kind of their whole team in general. I mean, Bryn Forbes in that Miami series, he was arguably the Bucks' best player. And kind of just a big reason why they swept is he got hot and you know, his minutes kind of haven't been the same stance. It's just I feel like that's a big reason why the Bucks are so good. But it really is like series to series. Um, our team, unfortunately, we were we were hurt a lot in the playoffs, so we didn't have as much of the personnel to plug and play like like these other teams do, where we can kind of keep switching up lineups. But no, they were in terms of the Bucks and, and their defensive coverage. It was they were. I mean, game one, I think when Trey had his his forty whatever game and um, his shimmy and whatever. <laughs> There in their drop coverage all game, he was able to get to his floaters. And then I believe game two, I think they stayed in drop coverage. And we came back to Atlanta's when they switched. And um, they started switching everything, which against us was really effective. And I think it was – they stayed in the switch game one, at least in the Phoenix series. Maybe it was game two. I didn't notice. And um, and Book and Chris Paul kind of had their way with switching on a big. So um, – but it's definitely changed. Like you said, series to series in these, in these playoffs, that's kind of the first thing – I noticed um, that every team, you definitely, every team starts to play a different way than obviously they did in the regular season. Just such a different game. We had Taylor Rooks on recently, um, who is from Atlanta. Um, She lives in New York now, but um, is a huge Hawks fan. And I made a passing comment that the Hawks run to the conference finals was surprising. Maybe that's the wrong word. I don't know. But for a, a lot of casual NBA fans, I think the Hawks, being the the fifth seed, not having home court in any of the rounds. It was a surprising run to the conference finals. What was your team's level of confidence when the playoffs started? I mean, it was, it was really high. And I feel like it's so like easy to say, it's so cliche to say, you know, there's, there's locker rooms tight. Everyone has each other's backs. You know, we're, we're confident young team, blah, blah, blah. Like, I feel like in a lot of ways we just stayed in the moment and it was, we didn't really think about, you know, we're playing the Knicks and, you know, we thought we were better than the Knicks even before the series started, but there's a lot of other people you go into the Philly series and the, and the Milwaukee series where there's a lot of people that argue it's like, they might've been better teams, but it's kind of like, that wasn't really just how we felt. And then the locker room was, all right, we're going game by game. And, you know, why would we not be confident? And just like you said, when there's no pressure on you, when everyone is kind of surprised at when you're winning and when you're not supposed to be winning, it's pretty easy to go into games and just kind of be like, well, I mean, if we lose, we're supposed to lose. If we're not, then it doesn't really matter. And we just we really stayed in the moment, really game by game. We we didn't get ahead of ourselves, which I guess is tough to do when you're kind of surprising everybody. But um, we're talented and you know, we kind of we went. When we started the year, we had a really deep team, really young team, but we felt like we were really, really talented and beat some pretty good teams over the course of the year that we thought if we could just get everyone healthy, we could kind of get everyone healthy and get into the playoffs and obviously find matchups that we like, we'd be a pretty tough out, especially with the way Trey can kind of control a game and um, defensively with Clint kind of being our anchor. And um, I mean, we have shooters that obviously you saw in, in a couple of these series. We just felt like in a lot of ways, we had a complete team that, people might not be aware of and, and hadn't seen before. And so when we got in the playoffs, again, it, a lot of it did start with Trey, just kind of his fearlessness and, and how he plays, but everyone fed off that. And it was, um, there was a lot of confidence. Honestly, that was the first thing was there was a lot of belief. There was a lot of confidence because it's like, why would we not have that belief or confidence? I, I got a, um, so I, you, you know this obviously, but there's a, there's a large contingent of minority owners uh, in, in the ownership group with Atlanta. Tony Ressler's the main guy, and then yep. there's a bunch of smaller owners. And a few of them are Duke guys, uh, Grant <laughs> being one of them. And then there's a couple Duke guys up here in New York that I'm friends with. And uh, one of them texts me before the Knicks series. He's like, do you think we have any chance? And I'm like, I, I think you're going to sweep them. Like, I, yeah. I, that, that to me was an obvious, like, Hawks are going to win that series. You guys just had, I, to me, it was uh, way too much skill relative to, to what the Knicks had. So right. I, I wasn't surprised there. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about that series, though, because for a lot of people uh, on the national stage who maybe don't pay attention to the Hawks, uh, your boy Trey is an absolute asshole on the court. <laughs> and he he just it, it. I don't want to bring myself into it, but, you know, in some ways, like I was reminded of 
me being at Duke and like being the villain. And yeah. I was like, yo, I can, I can really appreciate just how much he embraced that role in that series. He does. And it, I feel like you could relate to this the most people get, it's a big top. People love to talk about it. You know, the, the bowing, um, the shimmying, I feel like it's a fun way to play the game, but here's what I've been explaining to people in the last month or so. We're at like, we're at the highest level of our game. Obviously you, you come up your whole life. Everyone, obviously all of us tells us how great we are. If you get into MSG playing the Knicks in the playoffs of, like I said, the highest playoff in basketball in the third possession of the game, the whole entire crowd is chanting F you Trey, like F you. If you get that, like, I feel like I'm not Trey, but I feel like if I had all those people chanting F you, I, the first chance I get, I'm doing something back to the crowd It's kind of like an F you back. So this is what I say to people. I'm like, I feel like one, if you're in the same situation, you would do the same thing back. But two, it's like he, and maybe he does. I just feel like he didn't create the hate in that series. That was like right away, New York was on him. New York singled him out and was like, we're going to try to get in this guy's head. We're going to try to flip him. And I mean, Trey, that whole series, you know, talk the talk and he walked the walk. And, you know, obviously at, at game five, he bowed. He kind of put, a, put away the series. But that wasn't, for me, that wasn't something he started. And people love to talk about, again, what he was doing during the game. But I'm like, Third possession, game one in their place. He didn't do anything to create it. There was no beef like during the year between our two teams. They had beat us three times, and we overall were just like, all right, whatever. And third possession, it's F you, Trey. I feel like I would – for me, myself, I would do something back. And, again, you're – I feel like you know what that's like being a Duke. Well, <laughs> I was I was going to I was gonna chime in here that basically, you know, my, my freshman year, we played um, all home games, and then our first few – uh, road games were at neutral sites. We played UCLA at Conseco at the time, whatever it's called now, uh, in, in Indiana. Uh, we played Greensboro Coliseum in the Big Ten ACC Challenge against Ohio State. Then we we broke for Christmas. We had a couple home games at Christmas. And then right after the new year, we go to Clemson. It's our first real road game. And we're undefeated. And I'm having a pretty good year to that point. And I get out for warmups and it's like, They've singled, they, to your point, they've singled me out. Like I didn't, I don't think I've done anything to this point. And so it took a little bit of time, but at some point you just, honestly, you just have to embrace it because, you know, there's that video that was on the internet of all the fans out, <laughs> at the Knicks fans out in the street, uh, screaming after they won. Um, and a lot of it directed towards Trey and it's just like, okay, if they're going to treat me this way. Uh, I have no choice. I just got, I've got to be the villain. I've got to put on a show. It's part of the performance, the bowing, the head nodding, the, 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 the smiles, the waving to the crowd, the blowing kisses, all that shit. I love it. Yeah, I, love it. I mean, it's part of the show. It's the entertainment, right? It's the entertainment of the NBA, but yeah, you got to embrace it. You know, I feel like if, if you don't, you kind of let it eat at you and that's even worse. Did, so. uh, did they give you anything, any shit? They didn't. Yeah. You know, um, I'm from New York. I'm not from the city. I got a lot of reminders of that during that series on social media. Um, but I feel like overall I was pretty safe again. Probably half those people in the stands didn't know who I was at the time. So um, again, there was a lot of attention on people that weren't me, which was good. Again, it was a tough crowd. How would you describe Clifton Park? Clifton Park, New York. How would you describe it? It is, if there was a poster for the American suburb, that's what it would probably be. It's a... Uh, you know, it's, it's about 20 minutes north of Albany. Um, you know, just a great place to, to grow up. There's Saratoga. We got a lake. We got a great uh, a racetrack in the summer that just started last week. Uh, popular place. Again, if, if you're in New York, we got uh, all, the bar, all the bars still people go up. Patino, it's a big spot. Um, Red Sox owner, some has a, has a house on the lake. So it's a big time summer spot for me. Um, there's probably nothing up there other than Lake George and the track and in the city that you guys would know and be able to connect to, but it's a great suburb, great place to grow up. So for the, for the fans listening to this, who don't know much about your backstory, Kevin, like at what point in your, at what point were you like, okay, the NBA is actually a realistic possibility because I would assume there's not a ton of uh, NBA talent coming in and out of Clifton park every year or so. Not exactly. Um, it was honestly, it was, it was like my, my freshman year in college was kind of the first time I started to think about it. And I played for like my senior in high school, I played for a USA team. We traveled my freshman year after college played in the USA team. And I guess I probably should have started to think about it more there. You know, my, 
my 18, like USA team was, was unbelievably stacked. You know, Trey, Michael Porter, Markel, Mo Bamba. Like we had just, every player on that team is now in the NBA. And at the time it was like, you probably knew all those guys are going to be, be in the NBA, but um, I didn't start thinking until really in college. Um, I love college. I love playing. I love playing in college. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, and then really it was kind of after my sophomore year that, you know, went through the process. And again, even after my sophomore year, I wasn't even going to, I wasn't going to go through the draft process. We finished that year. We lose to Wisconsin in the big 10 tournament. Um, think we're going to make the NCAA tournament. Don't make it. Think we're going to be in the NIT for sure as a one or two seed. Don't make the NIT and all of a sudden our season's over. And so we're, I'm like, we had practiced a week leading up to the NIT selection show. And all of a sudden we're like, sitting in the training room, I'm, I'm icing my, my knees or whatever. And it's all of a sudden your season's done. So um, I went through the draft process because my dad wanted me to play pickup. He thought it'd be a really good opportunity to literally just get better. And Hey, like, you know, we think you're going to get invited to the combine, go there and just and play against these guys. See, you know, weigh yourself up. Maybe we'll do this again next year. And um, I went to the combine and played really well. So it was kind of, that was it with college, but <laughs> it kind of all happened pretty quickly. It really wasn't something I was thinking about in high school. You, you, by the way, you missed out on one of the great non rivalries in sports. Can we make Duke and Maryland. Happen? Do we like have, do we have the clout to like, to make this happen? We gotta have, we gotta bring back a, just a Duke Maryland classic. Um, again, it's a non rivalry. I'm not saying Maryland's a rival, but <laughs> they're, they're, Maryland fans yeah. are responsible this for is many this is years where we need of to get therapy. Going. Exactly. <laughs> Maryland fans are responsible for three years of therapy that I had. Um. <laughs> That's all people talk about. I, oh my God, we had. I don't think I could walk through camps without someone coming out to me and talking about how pissed they were we weren't in the ACC and when we were playing UNC, when we were playing Duke. And there's still so many fans in Maryland, obviously that that want to play Duke again, but want to be back in the ACC. So we got to definitely bring back some of those rivalries. Kevin, how did you not end up at Syracuse? They they didn't have scholarships. The whole the kind of the Fab Mello debacle. Um, they for my class they had one scholarship, or at the time I think they had two. They didn't really commit. And then Ty's Battle, who he's really good. I know Ty as well. So he ended up taking my scholarship uh, when they were recruiting me, and uh, they wanted me to either redshirt or go to prep school. And I mean, I had other, a lot of other schools at that level that were recruiting me. So they literally just ran out of scholarships. Um, you know, Sarah, they're always someone I was close with. They came and saw me. They were one of the few teams that obviously saw me in high school, which I guess I would, I would hope they would come and see me in high school, only being in Syracuse. But, um, yeah, that USA stuff, Coach Beheim, he came out to me with conversations. He's like, listen, we loved you the whole time. I just I couldn't get you. So um, that's how it worked out. This, this, I'm going to read a quote to you here. This is from early in your career. Um, so the question, the question was, when you're watching film, who are some players you study? <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> as a player, I want to be more of a complete package rather <laughs> than just being known as a three-point shooter. Coming out of a college, I got the Kyle Korver and J.J. Reddick comparisons pretty quickly. Those guys are unbelievable, but for me, I'm looking more towards guys like Bradley Beal and Gordon Hayward and Clay Thompson, since those guys do a little bit more off the dribble than Kyle and J.J., and they have more of a complete game. Blah, 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 blah. Anyways, um, <laughs> when I, this was like right after your rookie year, I think, is when you said this. Yeah. And when I saw it, I was like, man, fuck that guy. <laughs> like, literally, I was so mad. I was like, man, I'm going into my 14th year. Like, that's disrespectful, whatever it was. And, um, but then I was like thinking about it. And I was like, man, I was like, like, I, I, in a way, have gone through what he's going through for the next 10 plus years in that, you know, as a as a white guy who can shoot, you get pigeonholed. Oh, and sure. your immediate sort of defense mechanism is to. And I'm not. I, I, you're you're more skilled than I ever was at 22. I'll say that. But like my your immediate defense mechanism is like I don't want to be that guy. Like yeah. why do I have to get compared to the the older white shooter? I get yeah. it, man. <laughs> I get it. But can you just can you just speak a little bit about? Uh, that challenge of being pigeonholed when you are a white guy who can shoot? I mean, it starts very young. It starts very early. Uh, your AU days, and I'm one of the few white guys on the court, even back in the AU days, and you step in the game and the coach points at you and he, and he yells, shooter! You know, there's that's usually where it starts. Um, but no, I feel like I was, I guess, your defense mechanism 
for me, like I said, when I came out of the scene so kind of quickly that after my sophomore year, people who hadn't seen me played, and that was this was what I'd probably say 80% of the NBA writers and, and the people doing the draft stuff hadn't seen me play up to this point. So it was like, oh, this white guy from Maryland, this guy's shooter. So I'm like, cool. But it's like, you know, <laughs> your immediate defense, like I can do more than that. Like I'm about to play in the NBA. Um, so that was really, it was after my rookie year. And, and a lot of it, honestly, it was from freaking chasing you and Kyle around that whole year is like, listen, I can't, I can't run off screens and sprint and get to a spot the way these guys can shoot. I got to be able to do other stuff too um, at a high level. And so that was as much of a part of it as, as me trying to challenge myself and, and not pigeonhole myself and, um, and not allow kind of myself to be put in a role that would get me through the NBA. But yeah, I mean, it was honestly, it was from playing against you guys. And if that was after my rookie year, it was kind of like, it was eye opening again, seeing different people's skill set and, and playing against this guy and be like, oh, I can see my game evolving to be more like his rather than like this guy. Love it. No, because uh, I, so, so Lloyd, Lloyd Pierce um, had just, uh, you know, he, I think he brought you to a 76ers game in the playoffs yep. to show you sort of a playoff game. Yep. That was my second year in Philly. And it was around the time that you had said that. And I was like, uh, Lloyd, I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> so you like, made it through. Look in fairness, crowd. in fairness, in fairness, I, I'm only I'm only kidding with you. I actually don't give a fuck at all. But uh, in fairness, like you're you're much you're you're six eight. You're 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 much bigger than I am. Uh, you have a six seven something wingspan. I have a negative wingspan. Like we're we're two very different players. And I had to figure out a way for me to be really good and. So that became, I've got to be really well conditioned. I've got to be able to sprint off screens. So I want to share a little story real quick. I, on Thursday, I was playing Sabonic, which is a, a course out here on Long Island. And one of the gentlemen I was playing with asked me a question. He said, you know, he's like, I, I just don't understand why you. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, well, there's a lot of like, if you go to any level of basketball, there's a lot of good white guys that are between like 6'3 and 6'5 that can really shoot it. And he's like, how, how have you been able to play 15 years? And initially, I, was, I handled the question well, but initially I was a little pissed off. But then when I left, I was kind of like, no, I get it. Like, If you've played basketball at any level and there's that spot up white guy shooter that can't do anything else, then yes, like I get why people want to make that comp because you can only compare what you know. Um, you know what I mean? You can, you can only make the comp on what you know. Um, but what I, what I said to him was, is like, number one, I can play basketball, but number two, it's like, if I was in a gym and you got the best D three shooter and the best D two shooter and the best D one shooter, and we shot spot shots, stand still from 50, you know, 50 shots from NBA range. Like I'm probably going to lose that. I honestly, I'm probably going to lose that. But if we went and played in a game, I'm getting buckets. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm getting buckets. Sure. I would argue you'd lose that either. I feel like well, that's I'd a shock. You get, to, you get to NBA range. Guys can't shoot that far. But no, I totally know what you mean. It's You hate to say like a lot of you, you had the token white guy and it's like, how are you going to stick out? How are you going to be different than it's standing in the corner and shooting threes? And again, being the guy that when you walk in the game, they point at you and they're like, hey, this guy can shoot. Um, so yeah, it's. Again, it's kind of a progression. You know, I said that after my rookie year. Hopefully my game's a little bit different than it was then. Summer would not be complete without the delicious taste of sweet Northwest cherries. I, that is not a hyperbole. That is not an overstatement. Like, I have got to have my cherries in the summer. I love cherries. My favorite fruit in the summer. Beyond their sweet, juicy flavor and deep red color, cherries pack an abundance of nutritional benefits for a healthy lifestyle. Packed with antioxidants, research shows that sweet cherries have a positive effect on inflammation, helping you to recover from exercise faster, reduce stress, and even help with sleep. One of the few plant sources of melatonin, sweet cherries are a natural and flavorful aid in improving the quality of sleep. And eating cherries about an hour before bedtime may help stabilize and regulate sleep patterns. If that's not enough, sweet cherries are a flavorful source of potassium and fiber. Just two cups of cherries daily can contribute to healthy weight maintenance, diabetes prevention, and improve cardiovascular health. And with a lower glycemic index than almost any other fruit, you can satisfy your sweet tooth without worry. Fresh, sweet Northwest cherries are available now online and in grocery stores nationwide. 
Do your health a favor, stock up while they're fresh, and preserve for your year-round health benefits. Visit nwcherries.com slash sweet health to learn more. Tommy, this is a great story. In a tiny apartment in Southern California, two college dropouts teamed up to create a watch company that broke all the rules with fair prices, unexpected colors, and clean original designs. Movement grew into one of the fastest growing watch brands, shipping to over 160 countries across the globe. Now Movement has expanded into blue light glasses that protect your eyes from screens, minimalist jewelry, and more style essentials that don't break the bank, all designed out of their California headquarters. On July 20th, Movement is celebrating their eight year anniversary by running a huge site-wide sale. Every single thing is 28% off. Wow, it's 28% off all their best-selling watches, blue light glasses, jewelry, and more. Movement watches are awesome. I love the quality and look of their watches, and their sunglasses are super durable with UV-rated polarized lenses and timeless styles. It also makes the perfect gift for family and friends. Don't miss Movement's biggest sale of the year. Go to mvmt.com slash JJ and enjoy your 28% off. That's 28% off site-wide at mvmt.com slash JJ. Join the Movement. Did you have a, a welcome to the NBA moment where you were where you were just like this is a different level? Oh yeah, yeah. There was back to my rookie year. We're on a road trip. I think um, at this point I'm coming off the bench. I think I was a second wing off the bench. Um, so we get into the game and playing the Warriors in Oracle. Um, Kevin Durant's on the team, and so I like get switched on to him, and so right away. I'm like, all right, I'm guarding Kevin Durant. Obviously, you know, freaking out a little bit. And so right away, I'm like, all right, I'm going to get in this guy. Like, I don't – he can't just baby me right now on TV. So I try to pressure him, and he loses the ball, goes out to half court. So right on, I'm like, hell yeah. Like, this guy's about to pick it up. He's going to give it up. I'm going to be good. So I follow him out to half court. I'm like, I'm going to – I'm pressuring this guy. Like, what? And he takes – like, he catches it. He, like, looks at the shot clock. There's, like, six seconds left and takes, like, three dribbles. He just – Left hand, three dribbles, gets to around 18 feet, just hits me with a quick shoulder in the chest and just fades away, bangs the two. And as he's as he's going back in defense, he's backpedaling, just goes, welcome to the league, Rook. And so that was my first moment of like, God, these guys are just unbelievable. Again, you know, I'm guarding Kevin Durant. I think I'm doing a great job. He loses the ball. He's at half court, and he just hits like the easiest dribble pull up on me. And uh, we had guys on our team, like Torian Prince at the time, like broke down laughing on the court. You can actually see it in film. He literally like turned, he looked at me with like the biggest smile on his face because he was guarding him. But that was, I think, that was definitely one of my welcome to the NBA moments. It's at least one I, one I remember very vividly. You know, I, I always say this about Kevin it's like guarding him is is impossible for a number of reasons, one of which is that the referees allow him to carry the ball every time he dribbles it. Yeah. And when he came on the podcast, I pointed this out to him and he admitted it. He so did. when you say he took three dribbles, he had three discontinued dribbles by, wow. the, by, the, by the rule book. I'm just letting you know that. Credit for him for admitting to it. A lot of guys won't now. I mean, he's, you know, when you get to that level, they, they let you get away with a lot too. So each guy kind of has his little niche he gets away with. Uh, I, I brought up this this uh, that story of Lloyd bringing you to the to the playoffs a few years ago. To I think it was either game three or four in Philly. It might have been game six as well, but it was one of the Philly games in the Toronto series. And um, you know, just to be around the environment, or whatever. But you know, having just gone through the war, having just gone through the battle, like what are some lessons and some takeaways that you have from your first playoff run? Oh, I mean, they're they're endless. It's I think right away, just the intensity of the games is, is, is picked up so much. And each game, it feels like it means something. And that was kind of – it was an adjustment for me coming from, coming from college, I guess, was obviously how long the NBA season is. And, and you could be on game, whatever, 60. And, and honestly, there's a lot of nights you show up to the gym, and, and it's tough to mentally, you know, want to play that night. And it's, you show up and it's, you're, you're tired, you're mentally tired. And it's just, it's a long marathon type of year. And then um, it was kind of refreshing to get to the playoffs and just each game just felt super important. And I guess that was something in, in our two years, my first two years, we didn't have enough of those games, but it was nice to feel like you're playing in meaningful basketball, um, how you prepare for each game. Um, just, and again, the level of intensity, how the game is officiated. I feel like it was, it was back to, it was like real basketball. And that was something for me that 
people going into it, our media, everyone on the outside was, can the Hawks, can they, can they handle the physicality? The, the NBA playoffs are so much different. And, and they're probably even, you know, 10 years ago, the, that, the way that game was officiated is a lot different than it was today. But for me, it was like, it was back to real basketball. You know, the, the bumps where you're, you're sliding and they call the block as a guy, like all the little ticky tack fouls that they call over the course of the year that most of the superstars get. And, and you're looking at refs and they really don't have a good response of why they called the foul. Like all those fouls were thrown out. And it was legit basketball. Um, it was physical, but I think guess just just taking away like it kind of you know, talked about earlier is, is staying in the moment and staying game by game. Um, you know, not looking at a series as a whole, but looking at it as each individual matchup and each individual battle. And that's something I think Milwaukee's talked about. Um, you know, was it they've they've dropped game one of the past three series, and it kind of seems like. You know, they they just feel teams out, and again, they they change so much from game one of our series to game two, and it's the same thing in the finals now. Like, you know, each each individual matchup is so important um, that hopefully we're in these positions moving forward again, and uh, obviously in the future that you know we can stay in the moment. You don't look at series as seven games; you look at them as, as game one and, and game two. And uh, but there's so many. I mean, the playoffs were a lot of fun, and there's a lot of things you learn from it. You use the word matchup, and I'm gonna just kind of bring this up, but. To me, you you showed uh, your your potential value in this league, in this playoff run, because of your ability to match up, and in some cases, i.e., the the Philly series where you played particularly well, um, you were able to take advantage of matchups you have with smaller players. Um, like, do you feel like your skill set and size is perfectly suited for the playoffs? I do. I do. Just. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, a lot of those like, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to try to do a lot of different things and willing to be the guy that, yeah, and this is easy to say, you know, you're going to come off the bench tonight, you're going to start tonight and um, willing to be the guy that, that wants to play defense, you know, kind of that, that the ultimate glue guy is someone that I, I feel like I fit into that role, especially with us in, in this playoff series and was able to show that to everybody. But um, some I take pride in, again, being that, that, non-just shooter, um, a guy on the court that can do a lot of different things. And um, if you're going to be on the court in a playoff series, as you know, you, you need to be able to do more than just one thing. Just the level of basketball is so high. And um, I do, I feel like I was a lot of sh- able to show a lot of different things in, in this run. And it gets me excited just you know, where I think I'm at and as, as an individual level where I could be you know, in the future and hopefully next year. I want to just remind uh, the listener just anecdotally, and Tom, you can jump in after this, you know, Kevin – is 22 like he doesn't you, you don't turn 23 until the end of next month so there's still a lot as good as you are right now there's still a ton of room for growth and again given your size uh the potential is super high man I'm, I'm i'm really excited to play against you you know in the future and, and and watch you continue to grow it's been it's been awesome to watch you grow these these past three years yeah i appreciate that appreciate that a lot kevin you talked you were talking earlier about a little bit of the you guys were going into this with such limited expectations that it was almost like you were playing with house money to a certain extent. Like in the Philly series, in that game five where you had the crazy comeback, and then the game seven where I think after losing at home, I think a lot of people sort of wrote you guys off. W- was the was everything? Obviously, you were confident, but like, were there any moments of doubt where you guys were like, "All right, you know what? We had a, we've had a nice run to this point, but." This is this is like shaky at this point, or were you sort of always like because it it always felt like every time you got punched in the face, you like wobble a little bit and then you would come back and and when you sort of threw the last counter punch in game seven, they weren't ready for it. It was, and it was kind of funny. It just it felt like we just kept finding different ways to win. And I guess one of the lower moments, you know, that that game five, like we were getting we were getting our ass kicked. And I think it was it was the third quarter, the second quarter, we were almost down thirty, and like somehow we come back and we win that game. And it was almost like in that locker room after game five, it was like as much of shock as it was happiness. And, and knowing we're going back, you know, with the opportunity to win game six at home and end the series, but it was like, how did we just win that game? And so even after we lost game six at home, um, you know, we didn't feel like we played that great and still had a chance to win that game. So when we go back game seven, going back to Philly, again, we're kind of like, we just won here. We won game one here, but we, for the most part, kicked their ass and then almost blew it at the end of the game. But um, we had been there and done that. And we just kept finding ways to win. And we kept having different guys step up, 
that you know, game five, Lou Williams just got Lou Williams. He just got hot and he carried us for a while. And then game seven was my turn. And um, in game one of the Milwaukee State, it just it was always, I felt like it was someone different. We just kept finding a way that that's a lot of, you know, why our confidence is so high and why we never wavered is we won some games that we probably shouldn't have won. We can't talk about this Hawks season and this Hawks run without t- talking about Nate and, and talking about the coaching change. And I'm sensitive to the fact that there was a coaching change and, and Lloyd, uh, who I played for my first year in Philly, is, is my guy. Um, but I think so much of, of coaching, playing in the NBA, and, and I'm sure you figured this out by now, is, is about fit and the right personality fit, the right stylistic fit. Um, what made Nate the right guy for this group? In some ways, it's it's simple as he was just kind of he was a different voice. He was a new voice. Um, he was someone that we brought in at the start of this year that wasn't a part of our, our original coaching staff running from the last two years. And uh, was honestly, he was really quiet and for the first half of the year and, and didn't really say much. But it was someone that there was there was almost like a respect level. It was like he was in the gym and, and you respected him. You respected he used to play in the league and was a head coach and probably shouldn't have been fired in Indiana, but was. And all of a sudden now we got this, this great coach that's on our staff and just things just didn't go our way to start the year. Um, and a lot of that, like you said, I, I was, I always liked Lloyd, always appreciated him, but um, in a lot of ways, it just kind of felt like coming into that all-star break, like you needed a change and it was, you know, we, we might need a new voice. Just we're underachieving. I think we were, we were 14 and 20 and, you know, I don't think it, it definitely all doesn't point at Lloyd. And that was something we talked about was, you know, right now he's taking the fall for it, but everyone's underachieving at this point. And McMillan came in and um, even for that first week, like he didn't exactly put his fingerprints all over our roster, all over our playbook or any of that. He kind of you know, led us to our thing and we rattled off eight wins. And I guess that's the NBA. And, and two of those started you know, right when he took over, we went on an eight game winning streak. And it wasn't like he came in and immediately changed a million different things. It was just, there was a different energy in the locker room. There was a different voice. And sometimes they need that. And then obviously as the course of the season went on, he started to change things. And um, he was just great. It's, you know, for, for our offense who can, you know, first couple of years, it, you know, again, trade myself a rookie year. It can be erratic. It's fast paced. There's a lot of lobs, but there's not a lot of organization. And Mac kind of came in and it was, okay, you guys are really young. You play really fast and you, you're athletic and you do different things, but here, let's, let's mix it. We got to slow down. We got to run some plays sometimes and we got to play defense. And it was a kind of a, a good mix of him slowly starting to do that over the course of the year. And, um, and we responded to it. It was our team really responded to, it and he kind of kept pushing the right buttons and playing the right guys. You've seen this interim coach or this, you know, replacement coach midseason bump in the NBA a number of times historically, where uh, there's a new voice, team rattles off three or four wins in a row, in your case, eight. But to have that level of sustained success and then to make a deep playoff run speaks to uh, a bunch of things. But, you know, Nate is a, Nate is a great coach. And if you look Everywhere he's been as a coach, he's won. As a player, everywhere he was as a player, he won. Um, he's one of, to me, one of the most underrated coaches uh, in the NBA. So I, I, when, it, when he was in Indiana, people used to say this about Nate. Like They'd be like, yeah, it's like everything that Indiana runs is just very vanilla. You know, Their defensive concepts are vanilla. Their play calling is vanilla. And I'm like, yeah, but it's like the best vanilla in the fucking world. Right, but <laughs> like, it works. It's like just it works. really good. It's really good vanilla. Like, yes. you know, there's five or six plays that they're going to run. Okay, but they execute them, you know? And right. and uh, so I just, I, I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, watching his teams play and and and, and playing against them. He's, uh, and I'm happy that he's, he resigned and, and has that, uh, has a long-term deal in place. Uh, I, I want to jump back to last offseason real quick because, you know, I want to get your perspective as a young player, you're you're you know coming up on your rookie extension and a team that you're on goes out and signs a free agent to a big contract who also plays your position and i i just cuz I, I not that i had this exactly happen my early in my career but like as a young player there's got to be a lot of things going through your head uh when something like that happens when when the hawks signed bogdanovich there was obviously there was, and it, it was an immediate joy and, and great. We just brought in this guy. Um, but I, yeah, I remember I, I literally had like just finished working out. Um, it was like four or five o'clock. I was sitting in the locker room, I think with 
probably with John and, and Bruno or whoever else was on our team. And it, it just showed up that, that we signed him. And I knew he was a great player. Like it was like one of those things from playing against him. I knew he was great. And, but it was also, it was kind of one of those moments. It was like, you know, well, I'm here. So, so like now what is this, what does my future like look like here in Atlanta? And, you know, now that we signed this guy for a year, um, getting paid really well and deserves every penny, especially what he did for us this year. But yeah, immediately it wasn't, you know, I wasn't super positive about it, but um you know, my agent did a really good job of keeping me level-headed. Um, just tell me, you know, it's a long career. You're going to learn a lot from this guy. Um, you know, Atlanta still really loves you, loves the way you play. Just, you know, trying to win, I guess, a lot quicker than maybe our time scale was when we didn't bring in all these free agents. And, um, you know, he wasn't the only guy. You know, there was, you know, Gallo, someone who's been established and been a great NBA guy's whole career. We bring him in on a on a 20 million whatever year deal. And, again, a guy that you know is going to play a lot and um, – just brought in really good vets that right away it was like, okay, like things are getting serious around here. Like we're not, (laughs) the organization doesn't want to win 25 games again. And so I I think right away, you know, from the rest of that night, again, talk, my agent did a great job of of keeping me level headed. And it was kind of like, all right, like, you know, now how are you going to get on the floor? You know, what's your role going to look like, you know, and, and and how are you going to respond? And um, don't be the guy that you're showing up with negative energy, you know, the first day he gets here and, and that's just, you know, not the right way to handle it, especially in the NBA. You could, could have been out of here in a couple months if I handled it a different way. And, um, and it was easy, like bogey got here and, and I love bogeys. He's, he's a really good guy. You know, Gal is a really good guy. I think that made it easy is, you know, how they were when they got to the team and um, change a lot of different things. But obviously you look at the course of the year, it, it all worked out. And, for me, I, I actually, I love playing with Bogey. He's one of the other guys on our team that I like playing with the most. Just he knows the game, um, comes from a background in Europe where, you know, set of play team basketball, you know, competes at a really high level. He you know, plays a game with a lot of toughness. So um, brought him in. He's, you know, obviously we play the same position mostly, but he's also a guy that I love sharing the court with too. I think as a young player, this is such an important lesson to learn and navigating all of this because so much in the league is out of your control. And when you sort of let go of that, everything, it's not some of it. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're right. There's very little that you can control. There's like right. your, your routine is basically what you control. Your, right. your, your input, your input and your work is what you can control. But, you know, navigating that at, 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 at a, at a, as a young player is great because, you know, there's going to be a time in your sixth year, in your seventh year, in your 11th year, in your 13th year, you see it over and over again. Like you, you get to year 15, like I've seen every version of this movie now, it's getting recycled. And, you know, you're able emotionally, mentally to deal with it, I think, better. And two, you know, Tommy and I talked about this a bunch during your run, but I love the roster construction because you just put a bunch of skilled guys around Trey and Clint and John pick and rolls. And, you know, when Trey goes out of the game, you're not necessarily dropping off in guys, the amount of guys that you can play through because you have guys like yourself, like Bogey, who can who can do more than just spot up and shoot the basketball. I want to bring up Clint because Clint was like a throwaway in in a trade from Houston. Like it was basically just like we're going to just get rid of him whatever and didn't get anything really back for him. And he was so valuable for you guys and given your roster construction it was it was the perfect fit. It was the perfect fit. Completely. And like he changed the way we could he's just one of those guys. I mean, like Rudy Gobert you know, Joel, Clint, like I'm putting him in those Giannis, you know, those guys where it's like defensively, they, they like can truly change the way you play defense and change the way you play. And, and it was like, honestly, it was kind of night and day from the, from the point that we started the season, um, just how much better Clint was than I guess the alternative of guys that we've had that position, just like we felt like just overall we could funnel everything down to him. It was like, you can pressure the ball so much more. You can be more aggressive. You can gamble a little bit more, because you always know like Clint's behind you and he's always going to get a contest. And really he was, he was like, he was unbelievable all year. And I feel like even in some ways he was possibly underappreciated a little bit um, just being, you know, playing that Rudy Gobert role of just like protecting the rim and, um, and, and blocking everything. So he's been huge for us. Another guy, like you said, that just puts pressure on the rim. Um, one of the best guys in the league, I think at, at catching lobs and, and always being around the basket um, has really good instincts, but defensively has just elevated. I think everybody on the team tremendously ever since he's come here. And, and I was surprised as zero. I was like, 
yeah, I, I forget even what the trade was, but it, it was like, you know, we really didn't have to give up anything to get this guy. And, and, and I remember from playing against him, how good he was. And from watching him coming up, it was like, geez, we just got him for nothing. While you're layering on the SPF this summer, don't forget to protect your property too. Policy Genius can help you find ways to bundle your home and auto insurance and save on coverage. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare home and auto insurance in one place. They've saved customers an average of $1,250 per year over what they were paying for home and auto insurance. Their team will handle the paperwork to set up your new policy or switch over your current one. Getting started is easy. First, head to policygenius.com and answer a few questions about yourself and your property. Then, Policy Genius takes it from there. They'll compare rates from America's top insurers from Progressive to Allstate to find your lowest quote. And check this out. If they find a better rate than what you're paying now, they'll switch you over for free. So head to PolicyGenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. Last month, I wanted to give my mom the perfect birthday gift, but it's hard to find something for her that I know she'll really like. Then I discovered PaintYourLife.com. Our family hasn't been able to get together for quite a while now, but I found a way to bring us all together safely. If you want to give a truly meaningful gift, you've got to try PaintYourLife.com. You can get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at a truly affordable price. Choose from a team of world-class artists and work with them until every detail is perfect. Their user-friendly platform lets you order a custom-made, hand-painted portrait in less than five minutes. You can send any picture and combine multiple photos into one painting. I was truly blown away by the quality of the painting. This artist really captured the essence of my family. At PaintYourLife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. To get this special offer, text the word JJ to 64000. That's JJ to 64000. Text JJ to 64000. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. Terms apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. Again, text JJ to 64000. Kevin, what was your favorite meme about you during this playoff run? <laughs> I mean, you uh, I mean, there was a million. I think the Rick Ashley one, that was one of the funnier ones. I think people said that to me uh, a bunch. I think, you know, the Atlanta fan base had their fun with, with a bunch of other ones. There was a million. Yeah, I was, my family was sending them. My family was, was probably laughing at them more than everybody else was on the internet. But uh, it was funny. It was, it was a fun time, especially right after the Philly series. The, the only other thing, we're going to let you go soon. The only other thing I have to ask you, I talked to Evan Turner before we got on. And he had three. So my first question is, what is your favorite nickname for yourself? Because I know there are a bunch. The second thing is Evan said you were a good baseball player, which we should talk about briefly. And then the third thing is he said to ask you about trap music. So I don't know what that means exactly. ET ET is asking me about that. Uh, My favorite nickname, I think I laughed the most at the Kayvon one. I think that was... That was something that, again, for my rookie year, people just started calling me that, and that was something I was laughing at. Uh, I think Red Velvet's Red Velvet's funny. I, I did that, that Bleacher one, so the Bleacher Report thing on it. So either or, you know, I feel like that's something nickname-wise, I feel like it's like a territory you're not allowed to go into. You can't give yourself a nickname. You can't call yourself something. So it's like whatever sticks from the outside is cool, and you don't really have much control over it, I guess, if you don't market it yourself. So I always try to stay out of it. Um but what else? Et, yeah, I guess baseball. I played, yeah, I played baseball all the way through high school, and then trap music. I don't, I don't really know what he means by that. But he literally it's said, definitely, he li- not what he, I'm listening to. He literally said he, he knows way more than trap music than you'd think. And I was like, I didn't think he knew anything. <laughs> yeah, I think, trying, I think he's more alluding to I'm, I'm invited to the barbecue. So hopefully, I'm, uh, <laughs> that comes from this playoff run, but. <laughs> All right, I'm going to fucking, I'm gonna fucking like end it. this shit. I'm going to end this shit right here. I'm going to end this shit. This is going to swerve into territory that I don't feel comfortable going into. All right, <laughs> Kevin, this has been an awesome combo, man. We appreciate the time. This is great, man. Perfect. Thank you guys very much.